Hello, I'm Gina Kachechi, webinar host with WCG Center Watch. Welcome to today's webinar on Five Master Your Clinical Trial Budget, a step by step guide to smarter clinical expense planning. This webinar is brought to you by OCT Clinical. We're expecting the session to last about 45 minutes, followed by a question and answer session. This time, all participants are in listen-only mode. Please feel free to prepare questions for our presenters. We encourage you to ask questions at any time during the formal presentation. The questions will be addressed at the end. To ask a question, simply type your question in the area provided and press Enter. Questions will not be viewable by other attendees. It's my pleasure now to introduce our speakers for today. Irina Petrova is the Director of Clinical Operations at OCT Clinical. She has been working in the clinical trial industry for more than 15 years and has extensive experience working for both global and local CROs. At OCT, Dr. Petrova serves as the Controlling Project Supervisor, with project managers reporting to her on their ongoing duties and studies. We also have Polina Shatrova, who is the Business Development Director at OCT Clinical, responsible for communication with sponsors, development of study budgets and cost proposals, and making sure that all sponsors' needs are met by OCT. Polina, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the introduction, Gina. Hello, everyone. Once again, thank you for joining us today on our webinar. So let's start. Firstly, we are going to touch upon market overview and current trends, then take a deeper dive into the structure of a clinical study budget, discuss the main cost drivers and ways of study budget optimization. We will also share a peek on how to deal with out-of-scope activities and costs and how to stay within the planned budget. As a bonus to all who joined us today, at the end of the webinar, we will show you a checklist of hidden costs that will help you plan and manage your clinical study budget most efficiently. Before speaking to our main topic, we would like to put things into perspective and have a look at the modern landscape of clinical trials. I suppose you all know how rapidly the pharmaceutical, biotechnology, and consequently the clinical trial markets have been growing in the past two decades. Analytics at the online registry clinicaltrials.gov demonstrate that the number of registered clinical trials has grown by 35 times in the last 10 years. And multiple sources show that the clinical trial cost has almost doubled since 2008. In the past five years, we have witnessed a lot of mergers, acquisitions, and consolidations that resulted in the transformation of the big CROs into the giant ones. The global market for CROs is expected to grow by 50% in the next six years. The trend to outsource clinical studies by sponsors has become stronger too. Rising cost of running a clinical trial and global changes drive the implementation of new technologies like telehealth, wearables, RBM, mobile applications of all kinds and shapes, CTMS, etc. It is likely that the digitalization will contribute to cost efficiency. Indeed, a report commissioned by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services concluded that digital technologies could reduce the cost of a study remarkably. Summing this up, we come to a conclusion that with this shifted market landscape and use of new technologies and tools, it is now more crucial than ever for sponsors to be specifically thorough and vigilant in planning the budgets of their clinical studies. So, what is the typical structure of clinical budgets? The budget of any clinical study consists of two main big parts, cost of CRO services or professional fees and pass-through costs. Pass-through costs, we usually use the abbreviation PTC, 
are the costs that are passed directly to sponsor at actual expense. For example, travel, logistics or courier costs, cost of study supplies, cost of other vendors if they are subcontracted by the CRO, and of course, grant fees paid to the principal investigators and medical institutions for recruitment and treatment of patients. There is a false perception that the main big part of a study budget is revenue of a CRO, while in fact, over 50% of costs are pass-through costs and expenses that have nothing to do with CRO margin. Based on the analysis of the budgets of studies conducted by OCT, and that is over 300 in the past 15 years, we can say that on average, cost of our services comprises around 40% of the overall study budget. Let's look at the structure of the CRO service cost now. Normally, site management and monitoring costs are one of the highest in the overall structure of service fees. The second place takes data management and biostatistics. Then goes project management. The cost of services connected with medical writing and study approval, although very important in study organization, are normally lower, leaving quality assurance, pharmacovigilance and logistics behind. I would like to emphasize that when we say logistics here, we are only talking about CRO support in coordinating the import and shipments of the investigational drug, supplies, and other medications, while the cost of those shipments are passed through cost and may comprise a serious part of the total study budget. Now, as for the PTC, undoubtedly, Side and investigator grant fees usually make up the largest part of a clinical study budget. Such costs as travel, logistics, medication and supplies purchase, as well as vendors' costs, may vary depending on the study design and needs. And don't forget regulatory authorities' fees, as well as license fees for the questionnaires that are often used for primary and secondary endpoints assessment. Now that we understand the structure of a regular clinical study budget, let us take a look at the main cost drivers that influence every part of the budget. And I will let Irina take it from here. Thank you, Paulina. Uh, roughly, uh, cost drivers can be divided into two big groups, the second of which derives from the first one, the components of study design. Indeed, study design defines a lot in clinical trials, timelines, budget, quality standards, and even operational details. Now let's look into the elements of study design influencing the budget. Sample size, number of patients you need to recruit talks for itself, so no need to explain anything here, I believe. Indication is an interesting topic, and uh, it's not only about low or how incidence of a disease in question. It is also about particular eligibility criteria, which actually may narrow down initially broad population. Both of these key points, eligibility criteria and sample size, must go through a careful reality check and assessment to make sure that the study is acceptable in terms of the timelines and the budget you have. Trial competition in a particular therapeutic area also matters. For example, over the last couple of years, I would say we observed a significant increase in the number of studies in inflammatory bowel disease indications. The sites are a bit overwhelmed and, of course, it has negative impact on enrollment. It takes more time. We tend to get more and more requests for rescue studies and referral services in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis studies, uh, which fail to close enrollment in time. Uh, recently, um, our company have completed two referral programs in our countries in IBD indications. Besides enrollment duration, patient treatment and follow-up terms also define study timelines. It's, it is obvious that the longer study is, the more expensive it can be. Complexity of study procedures may call for using specific equipment not widely used in routine practice. So there might be a need to purchase or rent it specifically for the study. 
Sometimes it can be expensive to procure, deliver, and then at the end of the study, collect it from the site. Apart from that, complex studies usually require significantly high investigators grant because it requires a lot, a lot more efforts to, to complete. The procedure and study design may also require involvement of specific vendors, central labs of different kinds, for example, central imaging, central ACG, EPRO data monitoring committee, so the list can be endless. Comparative ground and rescue therapy may also constitute a major portion of the budget. Sometimes there is not much choice because there are very strict regulatory guidelines how you should design your study, what comparator should be taken. But at least all options of procurement, central or maybe local, or maybe by the effort of the site with further reimbursement, should be assessed before studies start. Organization of the study, as I said above, directly de uh, derives from the study design, and here the main cost drivers within this group. Geography, the selection of countries where the study will be placed. Relatively speaking, uh, study geography can be dictated not only by the study design, but also by the regulatory requirements of the target regulatory body, for example, FDA or EMA. The important question for country selection from the operational perspective will be the incidence of the disease in a particular area, as well as the treatment standards. Whether the suggested eligibility criteria and treatment procedures are in line with the local routine practice, so that there won't be issues with the enrollment and with the quality of the data. What will be the treatment challenges? What will be the recruitment challenges? And finally, how many sites should be involved and how long enrollment will take? All these questions should be addressed during study preparation and budgeting. Talking about critical paths, we should not forget about processes which, if not completed in time, may block for the study progress entirely. And sometimes this is not only the processes on the CRO side. For instance, IMP manufacturing or development of method of laboratory assessment, which needs specific uh, efforts and time and the like. Usually this is on the sponsor side and prevents CRO from further progress. In our experience, there were several projects uh, which were launched with a significant delay because of that. And of course, it had a significant impact on the budget. Once we had a case when the study was put on hold for almost a year, and uh, we had to reassess and replace some sites uh, after it, the decision to reinitiate the study was taken because the situation changed during this period. We completely changed project team with exception of uh, project manager and had to repeat all trainings. And besides that, two competitive studies started recruitment in one of the countries. So many assumptions used for initial cost proposal, the feasibility, changed and the budget unfortunately increased. So uh, now let's look at these correlations from a different angle. How various cost drivers affect different parts of the study budget? Indication and sample size through enrollment timelines and number of sites will have an influence on all services budgeted on a monthly basis, such as project management, site management, trial master file maintenance and other. Logistic support directly depends on the number of subjects and sites. The more we have, the more shipments there will be, the more money we will spend on the logistics part. Same about data management. In general, data management budget strongly depends and bound uh, to the number of subjects and sites. And probably in data management services, these are the most powerful cost drivers. Quantity of monitoring visits will also depend on the sample size, but actually not on study duration as sometimes expected. When, for example, enrollment is completed ahead of time and study timelines are shortened, we often hear the expectations that the number of visits should be less because the study duration reduced, but the quantity of EDC forms, the volume for verification remains unchanged. The only difference is that the same amount of work should be done in a less time. As for the past due costs, we see that mostly investigators' grant and hospital fees are influenced by indication and sample size. And here we should not forget about screen failures. 
if projected amount of screen failure is significant, uh, I would say more than standard 10%. Most likely, investigators will raise a question about screen failure reimbursement in their grants. Another, another PTC expense directly depending on the sample size is the cost of patient insurance. Treatment duration will again affect the cost of regular three monthly activities and monitoring. Complexity of study design will require more monitoring hours to check the procedures. Uh, also, complex and long study procedures, for example, picky sampling or long infusions of uh, investigational product or comparator, may require subject hospitalization, which will definitely be included into hospital fees. The gel mix will definitely have an impact on the cost of regulatory support services. Each country has its own requirements for submission packages, and sometimes it can be challenged to put it together. For instance, in Russia, the package is relatively easy to collect, but all documents should be translated into Russian language, which takes time and money. In Ukraine, the Ministry of Health requires a lot of documents from investigators, not only principal investigators, but from the entire team, from sub-investigators as well. GCP certificates, professional certificates are to be collected. In addition to that, accreditation and certification of each medical institution involved in the trial not only have to be collected, but should also be reviewed for validity. Of course, putting together such big packages takes more time and costs uh, a higher in respect to the services. Through clinical trial approval timelines, the study geography has an impact on the cost of monthly services because in each country, the duration of clinical trial approval is different. Also, it's, and it's not a secret that hourly rates of CRO may depend on the country. For instance, a CRO in Bulgaria might have hourly rates three times lower than a CRO of the same experience, size, and qualification in the United States. This is how the choice of the country may affect the overall study cost. Coming to the PTC, we see that regulatory submission fees may also vary significantly from country to country. Here on this slide is just an example that the difference can be really dramatic, many times higher in Russia than in Georgia, for instance. I've already mentioned the necessity to translate or notarize some documents or even the whole package, and it, of course, will also have an influence on the cost of submission. It is also a well-known fact that the grants for the same amount of work and procedures may differ in different countries, sometimes even twice as high or low, depends on which part of the world you are focusing. We would say that the per patient cost um, uh, is usually a raising involvement from east to west. And finally, in some countries there might be taxes and duties for IMP importation, for example in Russia or Ukraine, and in some cases, it can be a significant amount indeed. Thinking about potential study risks, bottlenecks, and critical paths at the time of initial budget preparation is a very good practice. It helps to avoid unpleasant discussion in the middle of the study, let's say if something uh, goes wrong. For instance, you foresee potential difficulties with enrollment. Then consider backup sites and advertising campaign. You don't need to use this budget from the very beginning, but you will have this money already planned and allocated, and if enrollment is slower than expected, you can use them without additional pain and discussions. We always negotiate the risks at the beginning of the study and are ready to budget appropriate contingency plans if this is approved by the sponsor. And the last point of this slide is the overall study timeline. It is interesting that uh, there is no direct link between timelines and fast through expenses. If the scope of services associated with the expenses remain the same, the PTC part of the budget will remain unaffected. Of course, I'm not talking about the you know, extreme situation when, for example, the study supplies or study drug is expired due to extension of the study timeline. COVID-19. It's still a hot topic, although we've been living with it for almost two years already. Here I want to share our experience how pandemic affected our budgets. Starting from the end, I would like to say that in fact we didn't feel much impact. 
Definitely, there were some adjustments associated with the additional expenses and costs. For example, for PDC part, it's PCR tests for CRAs required by some hospitals, or a supply of protective means such as masks and costumes, either for the sites or for the CRAs, tax reimbursement for patients to avoid public transport, or um, use, using a taxi during periods when public transport is not available, not working. For service part, it's the cost of our work for protocol amendment submissions, if such uh, protocol amendments were issued, or the costs related to temporary hold of operation and, as a consequence, increased study timelines. At the same time, on-site monitoring was reformatted into in-house monitoring. Uh, we tried to amend our budgets, uh, avoiding increase by reallocation of money and hours saved on travel into monitoring service so that in most cases we managed to stay within the budget or increase was not significant. We are often asked during bidding process to optimize or, speaking straightforward, to reduce the study budget. And we are always ready to look at the budget carefully to find an option uh, how to reduce it. However, there are th several things which, in our opinion, cannot be a subject to save on. First of all, this is medical writing and biostatistics services. Some minutes ago, I talked a lot about how important study design is, which impact it has on every aspect of the study, budget timelines, just everything. But I didn't mention the main point. The entire study may fail to improve study design or incorrect medical or statistical assumptions used for design development. Such mistakes may cost a study in the end. Every opportunity, external consultancy, or regulatory advice should be used to make sure that you are going to move into the right direction and get the results you expect. Also, this is not a good idea to save on grant fees. You may persuade the investigator to take part in the study, but you will see no patients and you will hear a lot of different explanations why enrollment doesn't go well at this site whereas other trials with a higher grant in the same indication at the same site will not have such problems. Uh, saving on CRO cost. Um, as I'm working in a CRO, this is a difficult question uh, to discuss, but surely it's always worth negotiating the budget with a CRO, trying to find ways to reduce it, and first of all, please sit together to make sure that the scope is the right one and no extra unnecessary services or expenses are included. Sometimes it happens. CROs usually welcome negotiation and feedbacks, but it would be definitely not the right way to focus on selection the cheapest offer before checking it thoroughly, as there might be hidden costs inside. And in the end of the presentation, we will offer a checklist with some basic questions which should be asked during a review of the budget proposal prepared by the CRO. Now, if you look into how CRO puts together the study budget, you can see that in the basement of, of it, there are hourly rates. Hourly rates derive mostly from the expenses the CRO has. As a majority of service companies, the biggest part of these expenses salaries. The more qualified and experienced the employee is, it's obvious the higher is his salary or her salary, but at the same time, highly qualified CRAs and PMs will provide the work of better quality uh, and will be more efficient and useful rather than an experienced low-paid person. And another expense is HR costs spent for employee training, supervision, motivation, development, and assessment. It all, if done properly, helps to retain staff in the company. Uh, the turnover rate, for example, in clinical department at OCT, for instance, uh, fluctuates in significantly around 10%. Change of key study team members, I mean CRA or project manager, is a standard point in our project-specific risk management plan. High level of retention of clinical personnel helps us to avoid this risk and ensure the quality of the services. I would also like to mention quality assurance cost spent for maintenance of quality assurance and quality control systems, trainings, and audit expenses. Again, for instance, OCD performs 
40 different audits annually, and only 20% are the contracted ones and billable ones. And finally, the IT cost. IT infrastructure, validated electronic systems, which are used for better control and integrity of internal and site-specific processes, such as CTMS and electronic uh, TMF, also contribute to internal CRO costs. So I guess you would rather like to partner with a CRO which has established and traceable internal processes, a CRO compliant with the international standards, CRO which has qualified, loyal, and dedicated clinical staff, and finally CRO which uses all benefits of modern technologies and develops the, in the, with the pace of the industry. Thank you, Irina. Indeed, these things are worth thinking about. Low CRO rates often indicate that some of those crucial aspects are missing, and you don't really want to work with a CRO whose quality management system is non-existent or exists on paper only, or with a CRO which have no proper IT security structure and not utilizing clinical trial management systems. On the other side, we have global CROs which are in general state-of-the-art in this regard. But since the assurance of business continuity of such CROs takes lots of expenditures, it results in very high rates. What you can do is you can think of using other, safer and less risky ways to optimize the budget, such as involving a local CRO which has all of necessary aspects in place instead of or together with a global CRO. Such partnerships often make the project more cost-efficient and successful. Choosing the right countries can also be a way of budget optimization. Some regions like Central and Eastern Europe can provide higher enrollment rates in many indications, along with lower per patient grant fees while keeping the high quality of data all GCP compliant. Here are some examples of multinational, multi-center studies conducted by OCT in Russia, where another CROs were covering other Western countries. You can clearly see that the recruitment rates were up to twice higher in Russia than in other countries. One of the drugs investigated has already obtained marketing authorization, others are on their way. Once the geographical direction is selected, let the CRO advise on the choice of countries that will optimize the study budget. Choosing a reliable CRO partner that you will trust the efficient planning of the study is hard to overestimate. Use digital technologies where possible. It might save you some valuable time and money. And of course, being aware of the possible hidden costs will help you coordinate CRO work and mitigate the possible financial risks together. However, life is life, and sometimes out of scope happens. Irina, could you please elaborate on the ways to successfully deal with it? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, indeed, especially in the long term, big studies, it is really difficult to plan study budgets with 100% uh, precision. Sometimes our project managers face the situation with out of scope occurrence. The actions in such situations are even described in our SOP on project management. So, first of all, in all cases, when it's possible, we don't initiate out-of-scope services or approve out-of-scope pass-through expenses until this is priorly authorized by the sponsor. Why I said when it's possible? Because there are situations Sometimes that, uh, for example, you must comply with the local regulations and should act immediately, um, like with the SUSARS, uh, expedited safety reports. Of course, even if you already uh, exceeded the amount of, of SUSARS budgeted, we will proceed with submission regardless of whether we already have additional agreement in place or not. Secondly, the project manager should not only present an issue of out of scope to the customer, but should also propose a possible solution. How to cover this expense as spent within the same overall budget? Difficult task, right? There might be still some internal monetary resources if you look into the budget carefully and critically. 
For example, you can change the monitoring plan and extend the window between the visits, but make the visits longer. I mean, instead of one day visit, two or three day visits will be done. This is an opportunity to cut on travel costs, which in case of big countries like Russian Federation may be quite significant. Besides, the cost of two-day visit services will be lower than two separate one-day visits because there is just one preparation, one study report, one follow-up, and one travel, but two days on site. Or you may look into the PTC part of the budget, make reconciliation of travel and logistics costs spent up to date, and see whether you can reallocate some spare money from there. Or if the study is coming to an end and you have some unused service units, uh, and you understand that since the study is almost finished, that you will never use them. For example, pro protocol amendment was budgeted, but it will never happen, or serious adverse events were budgeted, but they didn't happen. So you can reallocate this money to out-of-scope activities and services. If there is no opportunity to find some spare sums within the budget, then the only remaining options and probably uh, probably that to avoid somehow this uh, out of scope, or oh, maybe you take this responsibility from the CRO and do it yourself. And the last thing worth mentioning about out of scope is risk mitigation and contingency. I always come back to this topic because it's really important. In some of our contracts, we have a certain percent of allowed access for services or PTC or even both. If an out of scope occurs, and it fits the allowed access, it requires only approval from the sponsor's PM, which makes the process of autoscope negotiation much easier and faster. And we believe that this is a very good option to mitigate risks related to long out-of-scope authorization process and execution of additional agreements. Thank you, Irina. Of course, no one likes out-of-scope and budget increase, and we would like to discuss the additional instruments that will help keep up with the initially planned budget. Analysis of the clinical studies performed by OCT in the past four years has resulted in the following statistics. In 76% of our projects, we have stayed within the initially planned budget, with 1-3% to of deviations, both decrease and increase, which is considered acceptable. In 13% of cases, the amount of money actually spent on the study were up to 9% less than initially planned, due to faster enrollment, currency fluctuations, or lower travel costs than was planned for. And in 11% of projects, the initially planned budgets were exceeded by up to 15%. There were different reasons for that. For that. Starting from, again, currency fluctuations, change of cost of travel or IMP logistics costs, or change of the scope of activities and responsibilities initially budgeted for. Well, there is no magic pill that will guarantee you staying within the budget. It is all about planning. What helps us plan and calculate study budgets precisely is First of all, the experience of our team that is involved in the study budgeting at the stage of RFPs and bidding. As Irina mentioned previously, even a sponsor does not require that, we ask our medical writers and biostatisticians to review the study design and check the sample size. We always conduct feasibility analysis before we draft the budget. And before providing the proposal to the sponsor, we involve a project manager along with Irina to review the study budget from the perspective of organization of this particular project. Our logistics managers help plan the PTC, such as travel and courier costs, as precisely as possible. And the last, but not the least, is the very detailed and transparent budget grid that we use to calculate the budget. It is unit-based, it consists of over 400 lines, and reflects all activities that will be actually performed within the project. It took us years to refine it, and what definitely helps is, of course, a decade and a half experience, as well as deep understanding of the cost drivers and possible risks or hidden costs. And now, we are glad to show you this checklist of hidden costs 
as we believe it can be helpful to you in your clinical trial budgeting as well as in the analysis of the quotes of your CRO partners. We have summed them up into four groups. First ones refer to the right volume of services budgeted for. Do you think protocol amendment is possible? Are you sure the adequate number of SAEs SUSARs is budgeted for? Same about the number of monitoring days and visits. This drives the budget significantly. What about the frequency of teleconferences with your vendor? Some need weekly calls during startup, some prefer monthly calls. We also advise double checking vendor quotes, for instance, central laboratory quotes, together with your CRO partner, as well as double checking the number of medications and supplies to be purchased. Have vendors based their data management quotes on the same assumptions? Check and compare their assumptions, like number of CRF pages, queries, and coded terms. Ask for justification of those assumptions. Or even provide the CRO with your assumptions within your RFP. Same about biostatistics. The volume of statistical programming depends a great deal on the requirements to specific datasets. We are not only talking about regulatory requirements, but also your corporate requirements, if there are any. For instance, make sure CROs have or vice versa have not included the FDA package with ADAM and SDTM datasets, reviewer's guide, and defined XML, as EMA and many other regulatory authorities do not require it. Another important group of hidden costs is related to IMP management and that is something sponsors take on themselves. If you are not sure that the necessary amount of IMP will be manufactured at once and imported at once, make sure you budget it for several imports and included all custom duties to avoid a serious out of scope. As mentioned earlier, some countries may have local specific requirements for site fees, local ethics committees fees, startup fees, taxes and bank commissions, your partner CRO should be responsible for double-checking that. And in order to protect yourself from unexpected changes due to currency fluctuations, think about considering more or less 10% for plus to cost deviations. So we are done with the slides. We very much hope this was helpful. And now we are ready to take questions. Well, thank you very much for that very detailed and practical presentation on managing and mastering the trial bu budget. Everybody, now is your chance to have your questions answered by our presenters. Please remember, this portion of the conference is also being recorded. To ask a question, use the question and answer panel on your screen, type the question in the area provided, and simply press Enter. We'll get to as many questions as we can in the remaining time. Okay, let me check what questions do we have. Well, uh, I see that there are two questions that, that we can actually combine in one. Uh, let me read them. Hi, everyone. Uh, my question is, based on your experience, how do technologies and various applications help to reduce costs? And there is another question, what about EPRO? In your experience, can it really drive cl clinical trial costs down? Uh, Irina, do you mind answering that? I don't. Okay. <laughs> um, so in our company, we use um, widely CTMS system, electronic TMF, and we also had experience in clinical trials with EPRO. Um, and we are launching a trial with RBM as well at the moment. Um, actually, we don't have um, performed um, analytics uh, how. Uh, in 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 uh, US dollars or euro, uh, how you can save money uh, on using different platforms. But in general, uh, I can say that from operational perspective, um, it may help to save a lot of time. For example, taking EPRO, rather than uh, verification of uh, multiple questionnaires completed by patients in paper and transferred by investigators into EDC, 
Um, you may see this data uh, produced directly online, so you don't need to verify them. So CRAs will save a lot of time on the monitoring visits. That's one thing. Uh, the same about CTMS. The beauty of CTMS is, is uh, that you don't need to maintain uh, dozens of various project trackers, Excel spreadsheets, and enter sometimes one and the same information into several, um, several spreadsheets. In CTMS, you just enter the information once, and then it will appear in all uh, related uh, trackers and um, modules uh, you need. For example, deviation. So you don't need to maintain deviation log separately and then describe the same deviation in the monitoring visit reports and then spend a lot of time for reconciliation. You just enter them, uh, the deviations into CTMS, and they will automatically appear in, uh, in the report. So I would say that uh, it helps to ensure the integrity of internal processes and it saves time. And I guess that indirectly through this, it helps to save money. Thank you, Rina. I see some comments about, about whether the uh, presentation and the recording will be available. Don't worry, it will. Um, after the presentation, we will send you all of the participants the slides, so yeah. Uh, I see one question. Oh, do you have any issues with filling out clients' RFP? Well, if I get the question right, it's about sponsors' budget grids, right, to make the comparison of CRO proposals easier for them. If so, well, the answer is no. It's not a problem at all. Though I must admit, it means, of course, more work for the CRO because we have to match our grid to sponsor's grid and sometimes it's really hard. Sometimes, well, for instance, we see that there is no line for translations, um, just an example, and we have to figure out where to put these costs. like. Do they go to the medical writing part? Do they go to the regulatory part, to the study startup? So it helps actually when sponsors allow adding some lines in their RFP grids. Otherwise, it often comes to a lack of understanding what's hiding behind certain lines. Yeah. Another question would be, uh, does your methodology include site selection? What can we say about that? Uh, methodology, methodology for, of course, in every clinical trial, site selection uh, is, I would say, the crucial point. Uh, the better you select uh, the sites, the more appropriate they are, the less issues you will have further with the quality of the data, with the recruitment speed, uh, and besides selection of main sites, we always include selection of backup sites because sites may uh, fall out at any stage. For example, there might be sites uh, uh, which uh, execute, which has very have very very long uh, contract execution process, and you don't have time to wait. Uh, then, uh, if you have a backup site uh, selected and approved, you can easily replace this falling sites uh, and don't lose any any sites that you need for enrollment. The same about um, slow enrollment. If uh, you have issues with that, then you can add uh, sites which were selected as a backup or replace non-enrolling sites with them. So that's how I can answer. Mm -hmm. And we do a two-step site selection. The first step is preliminary telephone selection when sites complete questionnaires. Uh, and out of this very, very long list, it can be maybe twice longer than we need for the study. Uh, then uh, we shortlist the sites suitable for site qualification visits. And during SQVs, we check Mm, or sometimes they're called press study visits, we check whether these um, preliminary selected sites are suitable indeed and they provided the truthful information in the questionnaire. So that's, and then together with the sponsor, we make a decision which final list of sites will be submitted and initiated. Okay, 
I hope we answered this question. Another one, what details do you need from the sponsors to make a precise study about it all? Well, I have a lot to say on that, but I will try to keep myself in check and be quick in answering this question. Well, uh, first of all, we need at least a study synopsis. Sometimes clients come to us with a request like, what would be the cost of a, let's say, phase two study of a drug of this or that type in infectious diseases? First and foremost, every study is unique, and the difference in costs between the studies of the same phase and even in the same therapeutic area can be up to several times actually and I think you don't really need that unprecise ballpark it is very informative and even if we do have experience uh, like in my example in phase 2 infectious studies the numbers that we have are not relevant I think, uh, and well, I actually came up with a good example of infectious diseases because it's a vivid one. Uh, COVID-19 changed everything, and it is very hard to run infectious studies nowadays. Every infection unit is repurposed to COVID. Um, so my first response to the client would be whether they can provide a study synopsis or at least inclusion, exclusion criteria, and the list of assessments or a flow chart, otherwise it's a no-go. We won't be able to assess potential recruitment rates and grant fees, which are, I should say, a cornerstone of the study budgeting. And um, well, secondly, we appreciate a very detailed RFP, a very detailed scope of responsibilities, for instance, whether you would like your CRO to do the import of IMP or you allocate that to another vendor, whether you would like to have a direct contract with, uh, let's say, a central imaging assessor or you want your CRO to hire one, and um, what else? What volume of source data verification would you like to have? And timelines are also crucial, like when you plan to hand over the project to CRO, uh, when would be the IMP produced, when you want your first patient in. There are lots of smaller details that alone might not make a big impact on costs, but together they can make up a significant sum. So my point is, uh, provide every detail regarding the study, um, even if you think that something is insignificant for the CRO, because it actually might be. Well, I hope that answers this question in general. Um, are there any rules or benchmarks about contingency budget, for instance, 10%? What is the size of the contingency budget? Well, I think 10% is um, pretty much all right, but it is very um, project specific, I must say. Do you agree with me? Yeah, I, I do agree, and re it really depends on the risk assessment. If we see that, uh, especially now when uh, there is a COVID and sometimes you need to implement really serious and significant contingency measures, uh, so the excess can be high, but actually we base this uh, 10% on our own analytics, mm -hmm. um, how precise our pass-through budgets. Usually for services, uh, as Polina said, we are um, well within the budget. Um, if uh, additional scope is not requested from us uh, by the sponsor, for PTC, yeah, it's not more than 10%. Sometimes uh, even less. Mm -hmm. Another one is, do you use any budgeting software? I'll take this one. Um, we use an Excel spreadsheet with multiple tabs, hundreds of items. It's old but gold, as they say. 
there is no price list when it comes to budgeting clinical trials, so I'm not sure any software would be helpful. Well, at least I haven't come across any that I would find useful, so yeah. Do you agree that the budget optimization is not cost minimization? Well, actually, for me, that's synonyms. Um, I, um, I, 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 I do agree with this statement, mm -hmm. and actually, um, my last uh, slide was exactly about it. Um, when you agree on the certain budget and you sign a contract, the rest will be so the task of a project manager to make sure that the study is done with the same quality, within the same timelines, and at the same budget. If something happens, um, as I said, we always teach our project managers, look into the budget first. Maybe there is something you can uh, can uh, optimize, uh, use in a different way, organize some processes in a different way. If the if it's uh, if it doesn't contradict uh, SOPs and regulatory guidelines requirements, so then this is the, would be the most right way um, uh, to handle with the out of scope. Okay, thank you, Rina. Uh, do you have contractual incentives for CRO to keep budget and timeline? I think we are talking about rewards uh, and a rewards plan or something. Yeah, actually, our um, I would say 99% of our contracts are milestone based. So we have, so to say, prorated <laughs> uh, payment schedule when you achieve something a milestone, uh, then you get paid. If you don't achieve, you don't get paid. So that's that's the rule. There are some uh, other types of the contracts that we have uh, based, for example, on the monthly uh, monthly payment. So uh, the sponsor pays us uh, uh, for the activities performed at every every month. Mm, but uh, this is a rare case. Majority of the budgets are now stimulating milestone based. And sometimes uh, the sponsor may implement some fines, let's say if you don't achieve uh, overall, I don't know, some milestones, crucial milestones, or you don't uh, perform the study within by the certain date agreed in the contract, then you'll get fined if you achieve your targets before. Uh, that date, uh, then uh, you will get uh, reward. We also had such conditions in our contract, but that's not often, I yeah. would say. True. Uh, I think we are going to take the last one. Mm, do you plan out of scopes as risks? Hmm. Yes. 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 Sure. Always, always, and uh, our project managers, they. Uh, we have a standard plan called um, a risk um, contingency and mitigation plan, risk management plan, uh, and one of the standard items, as I said, is out of scope. So how to deal, and uh, there are conditions uh, for mitigations, description of mitigation measures, and description of contingency measures um, in this risk management plan for out of scope. Thank you, Rina. I think uh, that was the last question, and thank you very much for all of your questions, and I think we are going to wrap this up. Wonderful. Uh, do you have any closing remarks or comments? Well, we would like to thank again the audience, and we really hope that the info that we shared today was helpful, and you have, if you have any questions, just um, drop me an email or call me or anything. Um, I will be glad to answer any additional questions and help with, uh, with the planning and the budgeting of your clinical trials. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Irina and Polina. On behalf of WCG CenterWatch and OCT Clinical, I'd like to thank our participants for joining us today. Please be sure to fill out the, the survey at the conclusion of this webinar. Your feedback is very important to us. This now concludes the webinar. Have a great day, and I hope you join us again in the future.